Bitcoin's unique because no amount of capital flowing into a Bitcoin ETF is going to create any more Bitcoin. You know, what we've got is 900 Bitcoin a day. And around April 16th to April 18th of this year, we're going to go to 450 Bitcoin a day. This will be the halving, but it will be the single most consequential halving in the history of Bitcoin. Because you're talking about, it's the equivalent of someone coming in the market saying, I'm going to buy eight and a half billion dollars of Bitcoin a year for the next four years. Guaranteed. That's the demand impact, right? Eight and a half billion, $23 million a day at the current price. Today's video was a clip from my interview with MicroStrategy founder and the king of Bitcoin himself, Michael Saylor. If you want to see the full interview, it's packed with Saylor's predictions, why he thinks $400 trillion is coming for Bitcoin, and finally Saylor's advice. Hit that first link in the description to check it out, I'd strongly recommend it. Also guys, before we jump in, if you want to stay most up to date in the Bitcoin and crypto world, make sure to subscribe to our daily newsletter, The Crypto Nutshell. It's a daily email that gives you the latest expert predictions from guys like Saylor, any breaking news, and top on-chain analysis. All you have to do is click the first link in the description, enter your email, and you'll get our daily 5-minute email newsletter in your inbox every single morning. It'll make you a better crypto investor in 2024 and will ensure you stay on top of all the news in the space. But without further ado, let's jump in with Michael Saylor. I'm not surprised they're successful. I expected them to be very successful. I think there's 10 years of pent up demand. Uh, they're the most eagerly anticipated development in Wall Street. This is like Bitcoin coming public. It's like the IPO of Bitcoin, except it's like 10 companies simultaneously taking Bitcoin public. Because Bitcoin's a commodity, it's not a security. So the idea that, uh, that BlackRock and Fidelity and Grayscale and Bitwise and ARK, they're all taking Bitcoin public at the same time is a big deal. Um, the fact that I'm not surprised they're successful as ETFs because Bitcoin's the apex ETF. The other ETFs are based on oil, like let's say commodity ones, oil, gold, Platinum, silver, palladium, <clears throat> market baskets of commodities, natural gas. All of these things are defective as investment assets because com because physical commodities aren't scarce. Physical commodities can be manufactured in any amount with additional capital and know-how. So ultimately, um, the best of them is the gold ETF. But if, uh, if a bunch of money flows into a commodity ETF, that just actually fuels capital into commodity producers. They just dump that commodity on the market, the price gets held down. So commodity ETFs were never that great an idea. Um, on the other hand, comparing these, these Bitcoin ETFs to the S&P index, the biggest ETF and maybe the biggest development on Wall Street was the launch of the Spider SPY, in 1993, uh, about 30 years ago. And the idea that you could create an ETF that, that represented a market basket of 500 stocks, that was big. And especially that was big because that came along at a point where people had lost faith in, in the currency as money, as a savings technology. And so they were trying to figure out what is money. And actually an entire generation of people picked the S&P index as money, right? How, how are you going to store your, your excess cash for a decade or longer, not a checking account, not a savings account, not a bond, uh, but the S&P. So the S&P became money and that ETF became the monetary index. And that's why today amongst, you know, that that's the most successful ETF. If you look at SPY and all the S&P index type ETFs, they have most of the capital in them, but, um, the problem with those ETFs is that is that stocks also are not conservative. So if I increase the price of uh, the stock by a factor of 10, you're getting more equity. Or if another way to say it is, if I take hundreds of billions of dollars of cash and I buy the ETF, like S&P ETF, the ETF has to buy all 500 stocks pro rata which means they're going to have to go buy Tesla and Apple and Google and Meta at any price. They're price insensitive, even if they're overpaying. 
So when they buy it at any price, what they're doing is they're creating more equity because they're encouraging those companies to issue more stock. And then, of course, uh, this is common sense. If the price of your stock doubles, the employees and the company with stock options, they sell the stock, right? They sell the stock option. When they sell the stock option, you put more stock on the market. So the price, uh, the price creates supply. There's a price supply uh, elasticity there. And that's the same as you have with commodities. It's the same as you have with REITs, real estate investment trusts. And it's the same thing with bond funds. When you have capital flows into all those other asset classes, you create supply of that asset. They're not scarce. Bitcoin's unique because no amount of capital flowing into a Bitcoin ETF is going to create any more Bitcoin. You know, what we've got is 900 Bitcoin a day. And around April 16th to April 18th of this year, we're going to go to 450 Bitcoin a day. This will be the halving, but it will be the single most consequential halving in the history of Bitcoin. Because you're talking about, it's the equivalent of someone coming in the market saying, I'm going to buy eight and a half billion dollars of Bitcoin a year for the next four years. Guaranteed. That's the demand impact, right? Eight and a half billion, $23 million a day at the current price. Now, that, that's a huge amount, but more importantly, that's a huge demand supply shift in the year when the demand via the ETFs has jumped by a factor of four to 10 times the daily supply. So what you have is institutional capital entering and then you have the supply getting cut in half. And, um, you know, what happened with these ETFs? Well, uh, here's what happened. The approval of the ETFs was, was a uh, pretty concrete endorsement of Bitcoin as an asset class by the regulators. And anybody who's thinking about banning Bitcoin or not approving Bitcoin ETFs, they're now out of consensus. So it really flipped the global consensus from, well, maybe it's too good to be true. Maybe it'll be banned. Maybe it won't be banned. Uh, the approval of those ETFs meant that it doesn't matter who wins the 24 elections. It's taken the future of Bitcoin out of the hands of the president. It's taken it out of the hands of the next head of the SEC. It's taken it out of the hands of of most regulators in the world, it's we pretty much opened Pandora's box or crossed the Rubicon. It's very concrete at this point. And it was uncertain, right, before. And so that's a, that's a very big uh, piece of regulatory clarity. What happened next is it, it's created a positive dynamic where now I think you're seeing pressure to approve ETFs in other places in Asia you'll probably see Hong Kong spot ETFs. You'll probably see them uh, come uh, get approved in any country where people are on the fence. It also created a fee war. It used to be that you paid two and a half percent, you know, to hold your money in grayscale. And all of a sudden now you're paying one and a half percent of grayscale, but you're paying 25 basis points at BlackRock, or you're paying 20 basis points and even 19 basis points. Not only that bring down fees for institutional holders of Bitcoin in the U.S., it also put pressure on international fees. So you actually uh -huh. saw a rippling effect and people with uh, European or Canadian or, or other uh, spot ETFs in the rest of the world that had 100 basis point fees or 150 basis point fees, they're having to bring down their fees because otherwise the capital will flow out of their instrument into the lower cost instruments. So, yeah, let me let me convert the math here. If you have an infinite duration asset and you're going to put uh, if you're going to put money in it, then the difference between um, two percent fees and uh, twenty five basis point fee is losing thirty seven percent of your money. You understand like like it's like i take a third of your money okay so if you're a bitcoin investor 
you know, having low fees means you invest a million and you get to keep the million. Having high fees mean you invest a million and you lose 300,000 of it over the course of 20 years. So those low fees are, well, where is that, where is that going to manifest itself? It's going to drive the price of the asset up. First of all, because the people that own the asset aren't losing one or two percent of their money every year. But second, because there are a lot of people that they will either invest a million dollars in it or nothing. Right. So if I like it, I'll just invest a million. If I don't like it, I'll invest nothing. So you start to see money flowing from gold into Bitcoin, from real estate into Bitcoin, from the S&P index into Bitcoin. And so that's a big deal. So. So the, the launch of the ETFs, it's been very successful. This is the ideal type of asset to put into an ETF wrapper. It's definitely the mo it's the global asset. It's the biggest brand. Everybody knows what it is. It's actually the best thermodynamically sound investment. It's got the best historic performance. And of course, it doesn't have the entire array of uh, risk factors that a company has or that a bond has. It doesn't have credit risk. It doesn't have corporate execution risk, you know, and it, and it doesn't have uh, currency devaluation risk, and it doesn't have the physical risks uh, of real estate. It's not going to ever get hit by a bolt of lightning. There's not going to be a tornado. It doesn't have maintenance decay. It doesn't have property tax risk. It doesn't have the political risk. Right? Ask yourself the question, you got a billion dollars uh, and you got to buy some real estate in Africa? Where? And uh, where do you want to invest a billion dollars in a building? What, what country? What city? <laughs> where? Or you can buy Bitcoin. And of course, so you can see this is a higher quality thing. Uh, what was Bitcoin's number one liability coming into 2024? It wasn't uh, the risk. It wasn't the thermodynamic risk factors. It wasn't the technical capabilities. The number one risk factor of Bitcoin coming into 2024 was a government would ban it. But see what just happened in January, the opposite, right? So, so most of the FUD around Bitcoin is, oh yeah, it's too good to be true. And because it's too good to be true, the government's going to hate that you, you bought it and they're going to take it away from you. And uh, with the approval of these ETFs, it was the, it was the government of the most powerful country in the world, the United States, which, which is actually the leader of financial regulation. I mean, whatever the U.S. does uh, will influence Singapore, Australia, New Zealand, all of the EU, even Hong Kong, even China, for that matter, and all of South America and all the African regulators. So everyone's looking to what happens in the United States. This was a very powerful signal. So that was a that was a bullish development. There was a little bit of um, weakness following, you know, and and I think that's fairly well understood uh, as a couple of factors. First of all, a lot of capital rebalancing. There was capital sitting in the futures, uh, Beto and other Bitcoin futures, because institutional investors don't have crypto accounts. They can't trade uh, with most of the crypto exchanges, so they had to buy the futures. And the, the cost of rolling a Bitcoin position in the futures is like 10%. You know, like, I mean, imagine you have a million dollars and someone charges you $100,000 a year just to have the trade on, right? I mean, so you, you could see anybody with that position, they roll out of the futures and they're rolling into the spot. So there's a lot of that. There were some people rebalancing. They had positions in Bitcoin companies and the miners and micro strategy, et cetera. And they're rolling out of those trades or rebalancing or, or arbitraging. There's a lot of people trapped in grayscale and they couldn't get out. And then this unlock allowed some of them to redeem at par. And so there are some people that, that had, they had five years of pent up demand to redeem. And so we worked through that. And then you have the arbitraging between the, the high fee grayscale and the lower fee other, other uh, ETFs. And then finally, you have a lot of Bitcoin tied up in bankruptcy estates in FTX, in Genesis, maybe, you know, it, it, you know, BlockFi, Celsius, Voyager, Three Arrows, Genesis, FTX, Alameda. Well, all of those are states are controlled by lawyers. 
And the lawyers aren't long to, they're not hedge fund managers. They're not even 10 year investors, right? The lawyers have legal and process constraints. And maybe what they want to do is just wind down the trust, pay out the trustees to clear, or, or the creditors to clear a victory and move on, right? So I think there's a lot of selling pressure that came out of that because a lot of them were holding GBTC and they wanted to redeem the GBTC at par, right? And get liquid. And so I think there's uh, these are the transients, but at the end of the day, they're just transient factors, right? If you're buying Bitcoin with a with a, a short time horizon for a responsible investors, four years. So if you're buying Bitcoin with a four year time horizon, this shouldn't matter to you at all. And of course, the right time horizon is 40 years. It's like your your useful investment life, maybe. And I mean, the inspired one is 400 years, right? If you think out 400 years, you'll do brilliant things, right? If you think out 40 years, you'll probably make the right decision. If you think out, you know, like uh, 10 to 20 years, you won't have anxiety. Four years is the minimum. But, you know, people that are trading with four weeks and four months, right, they're just going to make awful decisions. They're the ones that probably panic sold it when it traded to 39,000 or they panic sold it when it traded to 16,000 or 20,000, 12 to 16 months ago. And they probably bought it for the wrong reason. But ultimately, what we've seen is Bitcoin came public. It's clear that you're going to be able to own this as property for the long term. It's clear that this is going to catalyze a bunch of very positive behavior by other regulators in the world. It's going to accelerate institutional adoption. It's going to embolden the political supporters of Bitcoin. It's going to create a marketing war between various Wall Street firms. We see that going on right now. And uh, and it's it's going to strengthen and empower all of the OG Bitcoin holders because even right now, people talk about, you know, what is BlackRock bought six billion of Bitcoin and all these new ETFs they bought. What have they bought? Like one percent of the supply. Well, that means ninety-nine percent of the supply and ninety-nine percent of the beneficiaries so far are the non-ETF holders, right? I mean, there's hundred X as much. But if Bitcoin's up ten thousand dollars a coin since this happened. Well, that benefit accrued 99%, right? That's a $200 billion improvement in the market cap of Bitcoin. And of the $200 billion, 99% of the $200 billion accrued to people that don't even own the ETF, right? So it's, it's accelerating, you know, institutional adoption and it's just accelerating Bitcoin adoption and empowering everybody else in the ecosystem to do all the things that they want to do.